Welcome to QD Clinic. QD Clinic is where we answer all your questions from Room Now Live 2023, held in March. Uh, in this session, we're going to go over your questions, the audience questions that we didn't get around to in this session on vasculitis. The session on vasculitis was called Advances and Evolution of Vasculitis. We had three great speakers, Dr. Robert Spira from Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, who talked about new therapies for PMR and GCA. Second speaker was Dr. Anisha Dua from Northwestern University, who spoke about the assessment of PMR and GCA patients in practice. And lastly, Dr. Carol Langford from the Cleveland Clinic talked about treatment choices in patients with GPA. We want to uh, thank Sanofi for sponsoring uh, this session. Um, you can see replays of each lecture. You can see a excerpted lecture at Tuesday Night Rheumatology. Um, again, you can go to the website or our YouTube channel and check out these individual lectures or the panel discussion. The panel discussion in this two hour session, we had 45 minutes of Q and A with the audience, but yet we still have more questions. So let's begin with the session on PMR and GCA treatments. Irma Vasquez Sanabria asked of Dr. Uh, Spira. Um, so in summary, should we use tocilizumab initially in patients um, with PMR? Uh, with a GCA taper or just GCA or just glucocorticoids, just glucocorticoids alone. So we're talking about PMR. Uh, I think what he said in his lecture was, if it's GCA, yes, and IL-6 inhibitors probably should be used right off the bat as a way of steroid sparing. The data is not so clear, although the data is accumulating on the IL-6 inhibitors, tocilizumab and ceruleumab and even the JAK inhibitors on their efficacy in PMR patients. I believe he said, one, that he would use glucocorticoids, and then two, he would not use methotrexate, and three, if the patient was a high-risk patient with severe presentations or was not responding, then there was probably then a role for IL-6 inhibition. Uh, Dr. Kure asked, once prednisone is tapered down to five milligrams a day, how long would you continue a maintenance of, 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 of five milligrams a day? Oh, this is a GPA question, but we'll answer it here. Um, again, I, I think, I don't think that was addressed how long you continue, uh, five milligrams of prednisone in someone who's in remission on GPA. My experience, although Dr. Langford did talk about the, the possibility of a GPA diagnosis and going off of immunosuppressive or antibody based therapy, my experience is, is a high relapse rate. And I worry about that. So I usually treat patients for two years and then based on their history and based on how they've done. I like to get them off. Some I do continue on little low dose of five milligrams of prednisone. Am I just treating myself or am I really helping the patient there? I don't think there's research to prove that point. Uh, Dr. Ad Adenawala asks, is, is ceruleumab given every other week for PMR? And yes, the dosing of ceruleumab for polymyalgia rheumatica um, is the same as it is for RA. It's 200 milligrams every other week. James F. Evans asked, how often do you really see a PMR patient with an age less than 65 years? I believe that was covered by, uh, to some extent, by Dr. Spira, and I, my, I sort of concur. Uh, yes, you do see people with a PMR diagnosis under 65. It's a much easier diagnosis when they're over 65 and over 70 and over 80 and they're white and they have all the things you're looking for. It gets harder as you get under 65. So between 60 and 65, you'll make plenty of those diagnoses. Between 55 and, and 60, not so many, and you'll worry about them. Above age 50, which is, again, theoretically possible, you should be able to count on one hand the number of patients you've made that diagnosis in. That's my experience. So uh, April Woodrow asks about a 75-year-old male who's referred to you with a history of polymyalgia rheumatica. Uh, five years ago, the patient also had vision loss. Um, and it's been about five years since the patient has take, taken prednisone. Now the patient with a diagnosis of PMR, not GCA, even though there was vision loss, I'm not sure what that was about. The patient now comes in with a right-sided headache and joint pain. Inflammatory markers are normal, sed rate and CRP. No synovitis now. Would a prior, uh, what to do, um, 
if the previous temporal artery biopsy five years ago was positive? Well, you know, then is then, now is now. I think none of it is a rubber stamp. If the patient really did have a PMR, first of all, a diagnosis of PMR and was treated as PMR and only PMR, you didn't mention that the patient was treated as if the patient had GCA, meaning all of a sudden the patient went on a DMARD or a biologic or higher doses of steroids. You didn't mention that. And the patient has been weaned off of prednisone. Now, uh, again, the patient has a headache and a joint pain is 75 years old. That's like 30% of all 75-year-olds. Whether or not the patient had a prior temporal artery biopsy, I don't think factors into your decisions about what to do. And now, this patient with a headache and joint pain, you're going to make your diagnosis based on inflammatory indices. You said those are normal. Based on symptoms, these are nondescript. And if you feel there's a need, you can do imaging. But I wouldn't do it. And if you really feel there's a need, you could do another temporal artery biopsy. Having one temporal artery biopsy done in the past does not preclude you having it done again. Moving on to Anisha Dua's lecture about assessment of patients with GCA and PMR. A lot of questions here about the need for imaging. So Irma Vasquez Sanabria asks, should we limit CTA, MRA, and PET scanning to newly diagnosed GCA patients, or should we do it in a PMR patient since many patients think PMR is preclinical GCA? No, you, if it's a PMR diagnosis, you should not be doing CTA, MRA, or PET scanning, fishing for GCA diagnosis. Just as you should not do a temporal artery di biopsy based on the possibility of a 15% chance that the biopsy is positive. The patient doesn't have GCA, you know, demonstrable tissue ischemia and damage. Um, you shouldn't care about preclinical GCA or some sort of form first. A newly diagnosed uh, GCA, yes, per new guidelines, needs to have an imaging test done. CTA, MRA, or PET, depending on what you can get away with. <coughs> Kristen Holscher asked for patients who have a PMR and uh, an asymptomatic GCA. Again, I would advise against this. If you're fishing for diagnoses the patient doesn't yet have. You're going to end up over treating. There's no evidence that that a lot of those patients will progress. Now, there are some patients who will progress from PMR to GCA. And you know what? They're going to show symptoms of GCA. You'll step up and you'll step up your treatment. But to fish out a diagnosis and over treat, not a good idea. But anyway, Kristen asked for patients who have PMR and asymptomatic GCA, are there recommendations for screening these patients as far as asymptomatic UCA? My answer is no, I wouldn't. And I think that the, the vasculitis mavens would say the same. Treat what you know to be true. Just because you find it on imaging, you know, imaging can be quite misleading, right? I mean, we're going to hear about next week the, the uh, sacroiliitis. If you start doing MRIs and showing marrow edema in the SI joint, you're going to overtreat a bunch of people who do not have ankylosing spondylitis or anything like it. I mean, this is true, especially for these kinds of tests. Uh, again, an abnormal test does not equal a diagnosis. It has to be factored into um, the clinical scenario, um, and that's what you're going to base your decision-making on. Uh, Dr. Papadoulos asks, I had a patient with recurrence of a temple headache uh, after sustained remission uh, and was turned away uh, for a temporal artery ultrasound because she had a temporal artery biopsy in the past. Can ultrasound be done for screening or not? Ultrasound can definitely be done for screening, but ultrasound in a previously damaged vessel um, that was treated uh, and now healed or not healed can be abnormal. So yeah, you, I think at that point, you may be stuck only doing, if you feel the patient needs to have a, a diagnostic intervention, your best one is either going to be a biopsy or a PET scan. PET, you know, CAT scan, MRAs show you damage. PET scans show you inflammation. And I think that the, the you know, a temporary headache, you want to know there's inflammation that you can commit 60 milligrams of prednisone to. Rena Modha asks, how would you go about a patient with temporal artery headaches, an episode of diplopia, uh, 
grossly elevated GCA, I think she means ESR, and a negative temporal artery biopsy. Would you treat empirically if you're unable to get a PET? So again, the patient has temporal headaches. We're assuming an elderly person. And double vision, not a predictive um, symptom per se. An ocular symptom, yes. Um, an ocular symptom in an elderly person with elevated GCA, but a negative temporal artery biopsy, I think you're done. I would follow the patient. Um, and actually, this patient had a negative temporal artery biopsy and negative CTA. So, yeah, you treat empirically, you treat the headache, you know, with Tylenol or headache medicines. Um, I wouldn't go and get an MRA and a PET scan and, you know, and spend more money to prove what you've already proven. April Woodrow asks, when would you repeat large vessel imaging? I would repeat it in someone who's had large vessel vasculitis. And now you're faced with a new clinical scenario where the question is, are the new symptoms due to large vessel vasculitis or a secondary medical problem? It's a little bit like repeat lupus uh, kidney biopsies. You had an initial one, showed nephritis. You, I would do a repeat, in, in, uh, and I'm not being in an academic center, I'm not doing clinical trials. I would do a repeat when the biopsy is going to answer a, a perplexing clinical scenario. And that's when you do repeat. I, no one would do um, repeated uh, biopsies, again, for the, unless you had the same reason. You know, I have patients who have Takayasu's. Do I do repeat uh, large vessel imaging? I always do, at every visit, a very detailed pulse exam of all the large vessels from the te temporals to the carotids down to the dorsalis pedis. Score them all, have them on a spreadsheet, follow them serially, and when either symptoms change dramatically or when something happens that's unexplained, like a three plus, um, you know, brachial artery pulse now is absent. That's when I get large vessel imaging. That's where it seems to have predictive value. Moving on to questions about GPA. Uh, again, Dr. Sanabria asks, in the UK, they use rituximab one gram Q4 months as maintenance um, and to induce remission. They tend to use low dose rituximab uh, plus 750 of cyclophosphamide, both as induction for se severe. I think Dr. Langford did talk about the use of either rituxan or cytoxin as uh, induction therapy as being acceptable. I, I think there's an advantage personally for rituxan from a safety standpoint, which is why it's become the standard of care. Um, I'm going to go jump to a question from good friend, the great Stephen Lindsay in, in New Orleans, who asked, do you ever use rituximab 375 milligrams um, uh, per meter square uh, for four weekly doses, then two more monthly doses, and then every six months? And and I think that I, I don't I think that sounds individual for the circumstance. The package insert, the way the studies were done for GPA was with rituximab using that. 375 milligrams per meter square weekly for four weeks. The, the follow-up dose uh, for adults with GPA or MPA who have achieved disease control with induction is two 500 milligram IV doses separated by two weeks. Um, and then that's given every, and that's, so that's done once, the two doses, two weeks apart, followed by 500 milligrams once every six months thereafter, once they're in remission and stable. So that's the answer to both Stephen Lindsay's question and um, uh, I think what Dr. Vasquez Sanabria is asking about, uh, again, those folks are doing something different than it's in the package insert. You know, and I don't think you need to do the only what's in the package insert, although that's the safest thing. Um, you're asking, is it okay to do what I do? Well, you know, until you screw up and something wrong happens, you're doing fine. I tend to give the usual rituxan RA dose, meaning two infusions, 500, two weeks apart. Uh, and then the first few every six months or every 12 months even. And then after that, every six months at 500, uh, even though that's not what's in the package insert. And I've done fine. Someone who was severely ill with lots of stuff going on, I'd stick her closer to the, the package insert. Dr. Vijaya Murthy asks, if you're doing rituximab,
maintenance for PR3 Anka with glomerular arthritis, taking 500 of rituximab every six months, but the patient still has considerable proteinuria, would you add a vacapan? I think you need to know why the patient has proteinuria. Adding a vacapan or more steroids or another, you know, DMARD, azathioprine, or mycophenolate on top of things may not be the solution. You probably are going to need to know if the proteinuria is a fixed renal lesion that's not going to change. It's always going to be some degree of proteinuria. Or whether it's an uncontrolled renal lesion that does need more aggressive management. I wouldn't put a vacapan in that mix. I'd be using, again, azathioprine or another DMARD. Uh, along with bumping my steroid dose, or if you can get a vacapan uh, approved and used, then yeah, go for it. Rena Moda asks, what are the endpoints in the avacapan trial? What's the benefit of using avacapan? In the original avacapan trial in New England Journal, there were two primary endpoints. The first being remission with a BVAS of zero at week 26. When they compared those on avacapan, those on steroids, it was 72 versus 70%. No difference at a six month time point. But there was a secondary, another another second primary endpoint, and that was sustained remission at week 26 and week 52. At week 52, it was significant in favor of a vacapan, 66% versus 55%. She asked the question, what's the true benefit of this medication? I think the true benefit of that trial wasn't to show necessarily that it was better than steroids or that you use less steroids, that didn't happen. Right, That really wasn't the takeaway from the study. It was to show that this is as good as steroids. And now we need trials done to show that you can actually use this instead of steroids or use it in, and so, so much so that you have less steroid use. Again, the original trial wasn't really powered to do answer that question. It really shows that it's as good as steroids. Again, but and in that one endpoint of sustained remission, It was actually um, not inferior to steroids, but it was also superior to steroids in a statistically significant manner. Um, Dr. Abakal Saud asks, which rituxan regimen do you prefer? Any difference with risk of infection? (coughs) Either 375 milligrams per meter squared or the uh, one gram and, uh, and again, I think that there's no real difference there. There's no great studies, by the way, looking at one versus the other dosing regimen of rituximab in GPA patients. Um, uh, I think you do the every two week infusion for convenience purposes, right? Also cuts down on the cost. But I think that there isn't a major issue. There is an issue with SIE rates on rituximab in vasculitis, also getting steroids. It's actually quite high, and you need to worry about SIE risk. But again, the Q2 weeks versus every week regimen is, uh, uh, there's no proven benefit of one over the other. Um, Dr. Nagarsheth asks, do you order annual CT scans to monitor retroorbital um, GPA disease? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I've treated patients with retroorbital GPA disease. Um, I think it's pretty simple. Um, I think you do one to prove that they got retroorbital disease and you can do, you know, a fine cut MRI as well. Uh, I think they prefer CT of the orbits. Um, and then you treat them and then they're, you know, you're doing well when their orbital symptoms, propto, proptosis, dyscongicate gaze, you know, superior oblique myositis, whatever the finding is, when that goes away, um, you know, I don't see the point. That goes away. Your inflammatory indices are normal. I don't see the value of doing repeat CT of the orbits. If you're not sure, then yes, you do need CT repeat uh, imaging of the orbits. Uh, Dr. al Ghanheem Nayef asks, would you use PLEX, plasma exchange and ankyl vasculitis with severe renal impairment? That we should ask Dr. Peter Merkel next year if he comes to room now live to lecture. You know, he did the the major study on that, 800 patients, I believe, long-term outcomes, looked at Plex, no Plex. He looked at, you know, modified dose, usual dose steroids, basically showing no benefits in patients with ANCA-associated vasculitis with renal impairment. Just this last year at, at ACR, they did a sub-analysis of that study showing 
that there might have been a numerically a numeric benefit to doing plex in patients with uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage along with ANCA associated vasculitis. But that was up, up to interpretation. So the answer is no. J.M. Murthy uh, asks, uh, current guidelines can initially recommend large vessel imaging for first, new cases of GCA and B, if temporal artery biopsy is negative, when do you personally do large vessel imaging in your patient with GCA? I think Carol advocated strongly for the guidelines that she was probably a part of in making. Uh, Dr. Howard Gandler says, at what point, if any, do you stop rituximab for low IG? I think you stop for low IG when they get recurrent infections with rituximab. So having a low IG is good enough reason. Again, the, the data on rituximab is you don't get it initially, but if you keep doing it repeatedly, then it may happen that you get a hypo IgG gamma globulinemia, um, and you just need to follow that. I, you respond to that if they get infection, in which case you should probably be moving on to another drug, or you're giving them IVIG prior to rituximab, which I've done in the past, and it's certainly an option, although it seems expensive and a bit um, ridiculous to do that. Uh, uh, Dr. Sokoluk asks, how long do you keep patients on PJP prophylaxis when they're taking rituximab? The answer is as long as they're taking rituximab. Rituximab patients in, with the diagnosis of GCA, plus or minus steroids, these are probably the, the highest risk PJP patients that you'll ever have. It's really driven by steroids more so than the rituximab, but there's a healthy amount of rituximab only related PJP. And PJP prophylaxis is easy and cheap. Why not continue it? Two other questions, not necessarily part of uh, uh, for what we cover on the program. Uh, Nina Trin asks, when do you order um, um, uh, imaging with large vessel vasculitis? I think we talked about that earlier. Uh, and she's asking specifically about CT of the neck of chest or CT of neck, chest, and abdomen. I think that you do it on diagnosis or when things are not going right. Uh, when you're using it to define an unknown situation. Again, Saud asks a lot of controversy regarding ANCA monitoring. What does the panel do? I think we asked that question in the panel, and I believe their answer was what I do. It's a lot like double-stranded DNA, meaning when you can prove that a patient with lupus um, has flares and activity clearly relating to the titer of double-stranded DNA, bingo, you've got a great tool. The problem is, more than half the patients, it does not correlate with activity. The same can be said for ANCA titers. I mean, there might be other reasons to do it, but if you're looking at it as a way of monitoring disease activity, if you can prove that ANCA titers correlate with what's happened clinically, congratulations, now you have a tool that you can hang your hat on. If it's not, and it's always elevated, no matter what you do, then you can kind of forget doing repeated analyses. Uh, and that's what I do. So I end up doing it once, twice, three times to figure out if it correlates. And then after that, I make the decision whether this is a biomarker or not. That's it for the, all the questions that we had at Room Now Live 2023 on vasculitis. Tune in next week. We'll answer questions about spondoarthritis. Also, uh, next week, we're going to have a Tuesday at Rheumatology on spondoarthritis. I hope you enjoy those. See you soon.